My name is Jay Wegman, and I'm the director of Skirball, and I welcome you here to our first Skirball Talks of the season. It's a timely, wonderful program put together by this lovely person, Marion Schnall from, um, I'm sorry, What Will It Take? Movements. And, um, <laughs> Uh, she's put together a wonderful panel, and um, take it away, please. Thank you so much. You're, you want to, you're mic'd. Uh, I think you're I'm, mic'd. am I mic'd? Does everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for being here. And of course, thank you to Jay and to the entire Skirball team for all that they've done to host this conversation and all the great programming that they do here in this space. Um, I also want to thank our partner, um, Caskill Carriage, as well as Gabe Roadbar and Lillian Hoverman, who helped to put this whole event together. Um, and also deep gratitude to the sponsors of this event, as well as our ongoing Women in Politics initiative, the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, and also Eileen Fisher, both of whom do, of course, such empowering work um, on behalf of women and girls and to advance women's leadership themselves. So please, you know, I would encourage you to find out about more about their work and support them too. Um, as a little bit of context and background to this event, I had written this book called What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? Conversations about Women Leadership and Power. Um, this book was inspired by a question by my then eight-year-old daughter, Lotus, who had asked me this very innocent question, why have we not had a woman president? And as a journalist, I decided to investigate. So I went out and spoke to everybody from Gloria Steinem to Anita Hill to Sheryl Sandberg to Melissa Etheridge to Maya Angelou, just looking at this question through, you know, as a lens into not only why have we not had a woman president, but why have we not had women in, in positions of leadership sort of cross sectors and cross industries? Um, and this journey of doing the book um, has been an amazing one. Um, it included Beyonce recommending my book about a year and a half ago, which uh, was one of the most surreal moments for me. Um, but this all inspired me to launch this platform, which is What Will It Take Movements, which is a media collaboration and social engagement platform to inspire women to rise up in leadership um, and also to be a connective tissue to sort of amplify all of the voices and organizations that are working to advance women's leadership. Um, what Will It Take Movements is proud to be a member of the family and brands of Intentional Media. Um, and this event is part of Intentional Media. Yes, <laughs> Intentional Media in the house. <laughs> Um, a part of it's a Year of Women campaign, so please go to whatwillittake.com. You can find out a lot more about our events and sign up to our mailing list. Um, we're hoping to have this be part of a movement, an ongoing community. Um, this is the launch of our Women in Politics initiative. Um, the mission is sort of multifold, which is to really encourage diverse women of all generations to run for office, uh, for all of us to support women who are running through donating, through volunteering for voting for them, um, and really this wider call to action right now, which is all of us can be a political leader and have a voice uh, by voting, by being an engaged, informed citizen, and just advocating for all of the causes and issues that are important to us um, you know, in our country and the world right now. Um, and I honestly cannot think of a more powerful moment to have this conversation. Uh, obviously, women are rising up in all kinds of ways. Uh, I think it's now over 30,000 women have stepped up to run for office since the 2016 election, and women are sharing their stories and their experiences. We're marching. Um, more than ever, there is sort of this sense of this urgent need for uh, gender equality and for diversity, uh, leadership of all kinds. And yet, even though there is that momentum, there's still this kind of stark reality of the inequities that exist. So women are 50% of the population, and yet, you know, across the board, you know, only 20% of women in Congress, only 23% of women in the Senate. Out of 50 governors, only six are women. And the number, these numbers are even lower when it comes to women of color. So what we'll be discussing today um, are, you know, some of these issues about what will it take to have more parity in politics? And how can we all amplify our own political voice? And how can we make sure that women's voices and visions are represented? Because we do face a lot of serious problems in this country and in the world, and, and we need to be at the tables where these solutions and problems are being discussed. Um, and first up, um, I am deeply, deeply honored uh, to be able to speak to House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi. 
um, who, yes, please. She herself, of course, broke a historic glass ceiling as the first female speaker of the House. Um, I'm incredibly just grateful to her for coming here tonight out of her busy schedule to share her wisdom and insights with us. Um, and before I do, I just want to read, uh, she was recently featured on the cover of Time magazine. Um, and so just a few lines that they wrote about her in their cover profile, which was titled, The Persistence of Nancy Pelosi. Quote, Pelosi is one of the most consequential political figures of her generation. It was her creativity, stamina, and willpower that drove the defining democratic accomplishments of the past decade, from universal access to health coverage, to saving the US economy from collapse, from reforming Wall Street to allowing gay people to serve openly in the military. It's not a stretch to say Pelosi is one of the very few legislators in Washington who actually know what they're doing. So please join me in welcoming House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Is my microphone not working? Um, so, so first of all, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, and you know, as the first female speaker of the House, what was it like both to sort of be the first woman to serve in that role and also to achieve that historic milestone? Well, first, let me thank you, Marianne, for, uh, for hosting us here this evening, to Jay Wegman and Skirball Center for uh, their auspices under which we gather. I want to thank Pat Mitchell for invitation, from TED Women for the invitation to be here, uh, because all of you are contributing to this important dialogue about the empowerment of women which I believe that there is nothing more wholesome for America, for our politics, for our government, for any walk of life than the increased participation of women in government and in politics. Women know your power, you are needed, and we'll talk more about that. What was it like to become, well, first of all, what was exciting was winning the election, because that was the key to uh, taking the majority. So in 05 and 06, Harry Reid and I determined that we were going to win the election for the Democrat, uh, I don't know, I don't mean to sound partisan, but you invited me, what can I say? <laughs> so, and so people said, oh, it's a time for a permanent Republican majority, President Bush is at 58%, and he was very high in the polls, but we decided that we needed to win for many different reasons, for, for our values, for the issues that we cared about, which we can share in our conversation, and we know how to do it, so we won. And then it was sort of inevitable since we won and I was leading the effort to win in the House and Harry in the Senate that we would become the leaders. Frankly, we were just so busy. I really never sat there and thought, huh, I'm the first woman to have this job or I'm the first Italian American to have this job or I'm the first Californian to have this job. And never, the only thing that I wondered about was that I understood I just couldn't understand why a woman had not had that job before. That was what I was really more concerned about and how we would make a path to many more women having opportunity because it really is so important. Now, you say there's 20% in the Congress, but we in the House Democrats, who are over 30% of our House Democrats are women, and over 50% are women, people of color, and LGBTQ uh, members of the community. So we have a very diverse caucus in this election, of course, we want more, and we will have more. Many women marched, and now they're, uh, now they're running, and it's a great thing. But uh, I, I guess I thought about it more as I was leaving the office, that it was a great privilege to be speaker. It's the third highest position in the land, president, vice president, speaker of the house. It has awesome power. And uh, we spent time uh, passing the Affordable Care Act, repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, reform Wall Street, a lot of, that's where we really, but I was thinking about more than uh, the, the title that I had, but the purpose and the mission uh, that I went there uh, for. Well, I think every time that we break a glass ceiling, it's so important um, to acknowledge and celebrate, and we you know, get closer to breaking the others. Um, so there has been you know, progress in, in different areas in terms of women's leadership, but progress in terms of women in politics seems especially slow. Why do you think that is, and what do you see as the pathways 
to creating change to have more women in elected office? Well, let me just say that it wasn't a glass ceiling. It was a marble ceiling. <laughs> it was very hard because for over 200 years there had been a pecking order of who would be next and who would be next and who would be next. So when I, people asked me to run and I agreed to do so, the others were saying, who said she could run? She's not in the lineup to be here. And I said, well, you know, we've been waiting over 200 years. We think it's time uh, for a woman uh, to uh, proceed into the leadership. And so I give credit to my colleagues, men as well as women, but the men especially for having the courage to elect a woman Speaker of the House, a tribute to their courage and uh, pioneership. The, um, uh, I do believe this. I do believe, as I said earlier, nothing more wholesome for our political process. But I do believe that it, if we reduce the role of money in politics and increase the level of civility in our political discussion, we will have more women in politics, more young, younger people, more minorities, more people of color, but especially more women. And some of the challenges that women face uh, don't worry about that. That's their problem. That's not yours. And women just have to have a confidence in taking inventory of their uh, what they have accomplished, whether it's being a mom, being a teacher, being a small businesswoman, being in the military, whatever it happens to be, whatever combination of experiences, place a gold star on all of it. Be proud of it and be your authentic self. The best advice I ever got running for office was be yourself. Authenticity is everything in women. Just every one of you just think of what you have to offer and how, uh, again, the connection you personally have and how unique that is. And then so what they'll do is they'll come after women, and you saw this in some campaigns, quite obviously, they come after women and try to minimize their stature, their accomplishment, that. But they also try to go after women on, on ethics because there's a, a presumption that women are more ethical in politics than men. That is an advantage that women have going into elections. So the other side will try to undermine the ethics of a woman. You saw that in the presidential, I think, very clearly. And uh, you just can't let them do it. You know, that's, as I say, that's their problem. This is a tough arena. It's not for the faint of heart. You jump into the arena, you have to be ready to take a punch, throw a punch. I'm just being honest with you. And, uh, and because you know your why. Why would you run? You run because you believe in something. You believe in a better future for our children, whether, whether it's about believing in uh, preserving the planet, whatever, you're, whatever attracted you to the public sector. Know your subject. I always say to people, know your why, know your what. Know your subject very well, so that when you speak, people respect your judgment, and they um, will respect it in other areas, too, because they saw uh, your knowledge. And then know your, be a strategic thinker. Show people how you have a path and how you're going to accomplish what you set out to do. But mostly when you run, if you run, uh, because that applies to almost anything you do, but if it's running for office, just keep listening to constituents. Your job and your job title and your job description are one and the same, representative. Can't represent it unless you listen to them. So that's what I would say to women. Have the confidence. Don't pay any attention to what they have to say about women, this, that. It's their problem. It's not yours. Or somebody wants to call the activism or truth speaking of women as an angry mob, that's their problem. That's not, uh, that's not ours. Uh, and it's just, it's inevitable, it will happen. Uh, and again, nothing gave us more, courage, more encouragement than the march. Women marched and now they are running. And isn't it wonderful? And women will win when women vote. Um, you know, sometimes this conversation about the need for um, more, you know, women's representation gets framed as sort of being, you know, a w women's issue or being an somehow anti-male, which of course it's not. What, you know, what are the sort of unique qualities that you think, without making generalizations, that women bring? Why is it important that we have women? 
Well, it's not that we're saying women are better than men, and thank you to the men who are here, including my husband, my son-in-law, my grandsons, <laughs> Thomas and Paul, and my daughter, Alexandra. It's not that we're just saying that the beauty is in the mix. You have to have a diversity of opinion at the table, whether it's men and women, women, people of color, young people, LGBTQ. You have to have diversity at the table. It's absolutely essential. What our founders had in mind, when they said e pluribus unum, from any one, they couldn't possibly imagine how many we would be or how different we would be from each other. But they knew we had to strive for some unity. And for that unity, we have to all be at, uh, at the table. Having said that, I think that women bring a special skill of consensus building. You're all too young, but we used to say, I used to hear when I was young, people say a woman's intuition intuitive thinking, making a judgment. Because women, as moms and caregivers and all others, have to make decisions like that. And so you're used to knowing what you're doing and basing a decision based on knowing what you're doing. And so that's why I say, know your purpose, know your subject. When you act, people will respect it. But I do think that people say to me frequently, especially when I'm a speaker, after a meeting, they'd say, do you know how different that meeting would have been if a man were conducting it? It'd just be different in ter terms of consensus building. And one other thing, women listen. Women listen. This is an important thing. Have you ever been at the table at a meeting or something where you'll say something great and nobody will pick it up and two seconds later a man will say the same thing and they'll say, what a great idea. And then you're like, what? I just said that, but I've only concluded lately, because it always amazed me, but I only concluded lately that the reason that they didn't salute the woman when she said it, they weren't listening. They weren't listening, so you have to make sure they hear you. They have you. And so that women listen, and they listen to everyone, respectful of opinion. I'm not saying some men don't, I'm just saying my experience is that uh, uh, we're all better off if we all have, have a voice at the table hearing each other. I mean, right now, obviously, it's, you know, it, well, first of all, it just looks just very daunting to run for office. And it can look, you know, a little dysfunctional right now um, in terms of, you know, the status of, of politics in Washington. Mm -hmm. So what message of encouragement would you offer to, you know, a young woman who's considering running for office? Why, why should she run, given those obstacles. America needs you. I mean, this, I'm just, when I went to Congress, there were 12 Democratic women and 11 Republicans. Now we have 65 Democratic women. I made a decision, not only me, other people, Emily's List came along. A decision was made to have many more, but internally, I knew that I, I, there's 435 people there. 23 are women? You must be kidding. So uh, we made a decision on our side, which hasn't been made quite on the other side, but I'm not here to talk about, you know, I'm not, so what, but it's a decision, <laughs> okay? It's a decision, and of course in our side, therefore, having so many women, we would be able to elect the first woman Speaker of the House, even though men voted for me too, but I don't think if there weren't so many women, there would have ever been a woman Speaker of the House, which has awesome, awesome power. And by the way, when you have the gavel, people listen. <laughs> so I do, um, I do, as far as a message of hope is concerned, just know this, you're needed. The country needs this. And I went to Congress in my 40s when my children were grown, or almost grown. My daughter Alexandra was going to high school. But um, I had four other, my husband and I, Paul and I, four other children were already in, high, in college. Uh, but I want younger women to be running so that they can achieve seniority on committees much earlier and the rest rise to the leadership in a much earlier way. But more importantly, so that young women and moms across America or just working women across America can see somebody who shares their experience at this, having a seat at the table to speak for them, whether they represent them in their district, representing them at the seat at the table. 
And I mean, in, in addition to the fact of just running for office, I feel like right now, you know, actually it's been amazing to see just the level of engagement of, of everyone who, I mean, I think that is looking at the country and, and wants to have a voice. But right now, it's very easy with all the problems that we're facing to feel disempowered that there's not, you know, anything that one person can do to make a difference. What, you know, words of inspiration, you know, would you offer to, to them? I don't know how inspiring this will be but it is politically organizing. Don't agonize, organize. Don't worry about this, that, or the other thing. Just get out there and make the difference. These women, this is not for the faint of heart, have decided to go forward. We have to help them win. Again, people of color, young people, LGBTQ, others as well, so that diversity is present at the table. But it is, uh, you cannot be get down on what's happening. That just is a victory for the other side. I guess I say to my colleagues all the time, no wasted time, no underutilized resources, and no regrets the day after the election that we could have done something more. We must, if I may be political for a moment, we must win this election. We have made a decision to win this election. We think everything is at stake, including uh, the balance of power in our constitution, three separate branches of government, uh, all of the liberties, a woman's right to choose, LGBTQ, uh, gun safety, immigration, uh, equality in our, in our economy, uh, name any subject, climate, the air we breathe, the water our children drink, all of it at stake in this election. And so we can't just moan and groan about, oh, isn't this terrible? Our country is a great set country. It can withstand anything. And, uh, and again, women will make a tremendous, tremendous difference. So I, uh, if, I, if it's in inspiring to you, it's a prediction. It's, it's not a fact because the election hasn't occurred. But if the election were today, if the election were today, we would have a tremendous victory and it would be led by women. And that is a victory for America, not just Democrats or Republicans or anybody else. It's about a victory for our country. And I know you have a tremendous panel coming up. I feel as if I'm the warm-up for the panel. They're great educators, uh, candidates, uh, organizers, and the rest. Uh, I would introduce them all, except that's not my role. Uh, but I am very proud to be on a program that includes them. But it is... Um, it's not a zero-sum game. This is important, I think, to say to women. Sometimes it used to be, another time, or even shortly before now, one woman's success was like, well, we have a woman. And no, any woman's success is your success. That is just the way it is. It just, it just is amplified. So it isn't about if somebody succeeds and that, that takes the place of me. It is not a zero-sum game. That success Pre uh, prepares the way for your success. And what I'm encouraged by is the fathers of daughters who have written to me to say, thank you for opening another door of opportunity for my daughter. And when moms say it, you understand. When grandmoms say it, you understand. But when dads and grandfathers say it, something different is happening in how our girls are raised in our country. Uh, uh, Pat Mitchell once asked me at a TED talk, what, if I were queen of the world, what would I do? The one thing would I do? And of course, I was telling her I would be very bipartisan and con uh, consensus building a lot. But what I really would do if I were queen of the world and had, didn't have to answer to anyone would be the education of girls and women worldwide. It, worldwide. Because I think that would be the most transformative difference in our society. Underutilized resource, but less so and less so more utilized more important to the success of our country. Our motto is, when women succeed, America succeeds. And that's just the way it is for any country in the world. But we know it to be an absolute fact in our country. So know your power, go for it, be yourself, don't be afraid, be confident. The world is waiting for you. You're, uh, be ready. I mean, I had no idea. I, I went from kitchen to Congress, from housewife to house speaker. I had no intention of ever running for Congress. None. And then, all of a sudden, I did. I said to my daughter, Alexandra, Mommy has a chance to run for Congress. She's in high school, going to college. Uh, no, just going to senior year. So I said, 
how can I, um, it's right with you if I would run, I don't know if I'll win. She said, mother, get a life. <laughs> and then I said, well, I'll be gone for like three nights a week. She said, what teenage girl doesn't want her mother gone three nights a week? <laughs> so uh, Alexandra got me off to my start. Fortunately, my husband and she bonded very well and, uh, and it all worked out. But it is, it is really important, and I'm so in awe, as I say, of women who can balance home and work and all the rest Young women, that's what we really need people to see in every elective office. We'll be seeing a soon-to-be state senator, Biagi, to talk, a young woman about her career. Yeah, well, I won't do the introductions. <laughs> but I'll just tell you this, and, and maybe some of you have heard me say this before because I think it's important. And I'll close with this, I think, Marianne, it's up to you. I, uh, when I first went to my first meeting as leader, I was going to the White House, and I wasn't speaker yet. I was just uh, President Bush was president. We were still in the minority, but it was my first meeting in the leadership. And was going to the White House. I wasn't apprehensive or anything because I've been to the White House many times as an appropriator, as an intelligence person, the rest. And uh, when I went there, went in the room, and there they were: the president, the vice president, the Democratic and Republican leadership of the House and Senate, and ten people or something around a table. And when I went into the room, I thought, oh, this is not like any other meeting I've ever been to in the White House. In fact, it's not like any other meeting that any woman has ever been to in the White House. Because here I am going into this meeting, not as an appointee of the president, which would be a great thing. Nope, not putting down the cabinet. That's important. But my power at that table was not derived from the president's appointment. It was derived from the vote of my colleagues in the House of Representatives. So I had my own power at the table representing me. So let's just say you're treated differently that way. And when I sat down at the table, and President Bush, very gracious and lovely, President George W. Bush, very gracious and welcoming and this or that, all of a sudden, I felt really squeezed in in my chair. I mean, I was just squeezed into my chair. And he's saying all these nice things, welcoming the first woman. Oh, you'll probably hear some new things from you. Ha, ha. And um, <laughs> I was squeezing my chair as he was being nice. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And all of a sudden, I realized that on that chair was Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth, Alice Paul. And everybody you could think of, they were all sitting on that chair with me, right there on that one chair. And then I could hear them say, at last we have a seat at the table. Wow. And then they were gone. And my first thought was, we want more. We want more. But it, it always, always an inspiration of what our founders did uh, to give women, get women to have the right to vote. When they got the right to vote, people said, the press said, women given the right to vote, not given, worked for, marched, fought, starved, were starved, separated from their families, alienated, and the rest, to fight for the empowerment of women. We stand on their shoulders. They really fought the fight. And then over the years, more people fighting the fight until we did get the right to vote, and then women's right to choose, and so many other things that are at risk now. So when you're thinking about running, remember what is at risk and the difference that you can make. And the shoulders we stand on of those women, and I have a responsibility to be the shoulders that other uh, women stand on, young women and others stand on. You don't have to be young, you can be just new into the process. So it is a, it's a sisterhood that has to come together. And when our, when our sisters speak truth, we have to make sure that they are respected for the truth that they speak. And that is really important in our country, not only for the person who comes forward, but for all of our, uh, all, the, all the women in our country. And it's, um, it's, we're at a threshold, tipping point. You call it whatever you want to call it, but it's different. It's a transformative place because these women marched, as I said, now they are running, they're going to win. They're going to make a tremendous difference. And I hope that in your heart and in your, your heart, because it's all about courage, that you will think about doing that too. Because when women succeed, 
America succeeds. Thank you all very much. Thank you, you. Thank you so much. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Mary, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much. So I'm now also very excited to present to you a campaign that I worked on with uh, myself and What Will It Take movements called uh, What Will It Take to Represent Her. This is a campaign that I partnered with Jennifer Siebel Newsom and the Representation Project, as well as the Berkowitz Brothers and their vid video production company called Not a Billionaire. And you'll see how much it resonates with the conversation that we're having here today. Um, I was privileged to interview some of the amazing and notable figures that you will see in this video campaign, in two, including two women that are about to come out on the stage, Pat Mitchell um, and Brittany Packnett, who are in um, this video. Um, and then after the video is done, um, Pat Mitchell will come onto the stage and, and introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, and before Pat comes out, I just want to quickly say about Pat, you know, Pat broke a, a glass ceiling of her own. She was the first female president of PBS. Yes. She has been a media industry leader um, for decades, using media as a force for social change um, and advocating for women's representation and sharing women's stories. Um, but more personal than that, she has been a mentor to me um, for just all of my career, all different ways of guiding me and supporting me and mentoring me. And the reason why I say that is because what will it take to get to gender parity in leadership? I really believe it will take mentorship. It will take women supporting and helping other women. And Pat embodies that in all the ways that she has mentored uh, younger women and just for as a voice for all of the causes and organizations that she promotes. So. She will join us after this video, and um, I'm now excited to present What Will It Take to Represent Her? Thank you. Let me tell you what's at stake for this upcoming election. The future. Our jobs are at stake, our health care is at stake, our child care is at stake. Our lives, our children, our homes, our land rights, our water rights, our sovereignty rights. The midterms especially are important. Who gets elected decides policies that will affect how much you make at work, how well your schools are run. We need Congress that is reflective of the needs of the people in this country. What's at stake for all women is transforming the power paradigm in this country. Women are the soul of this nation. We bring such empathy, vision, resilience. The ability to multitask. <laughs> Courage. We're very collaborative. We believe in sharing. We believe in cooperation instead of domination and discrimination. We come from having been marginalized for so long, and so there is innately a sense of necessity of voice. The smartest people I know are women. It is so important for people my age and people younger than me, like my little sister, she's only two, to feel like they can turn on the TV and see someone that looks just like them. I want a woman on the committee when decisions are being made about my health. Make sure that those who are in office actually speak for all of us. We need all the different lenses when we're making these decisions. We need to make sure that every single day the folks who are at the margins are getting their needs met. Representation matters. The reason why people should vote is because their lives depend on it, literally. Because someone died for you to have that right. Someone marched for you, someone sang for you, someone suffered for you to have the right to vote. And one of the places to make sure that voices like mine and other marginalized voices are heard is at the voting booth. Find out the people who are making change and vote for them. Support candidates who support all people. Invest in, support, and add oxygen to every single act of courage and organizing that's happening among women. It's democracy. It's, it's what we come here for. It's why we're here. It is shaping the future for ourselves and for our children. When our economy and our democracy works for women, it works for everyone. What will it take to represent her? You. Get out and vote.
Wow. <laughs> that, that was either for the great video or for this great panel. And I, I hope it was for both. How encouraging it is for us to stand back there and to look out and to see so many of you here on a Monday night in New York, knowing that you take this subject seriously and you want to be a part of our uh, finding new ways to answer the question, what will it take to represent her? And one thing we know that it will take is more women like this who are on this panel, more women and men like you in this audience. What Marianne said is something that I think we'll take away tonight, which is that it will take each and every one of us working for each other, supporting and advocating. And we have such a great group of life stories and personal experiences to further illuminate the challenges as well as this big opportunity ahead of us um, to bring this country to one in which we want to live in and, and leave for our children. So I'm going to tell you quickly who's on the panel and then as I introduce each one a little bit more about them and do a line of questioning with each and then we'll just uh, engage in conversation. So with us tonight, the Democratic candidate for the New York State Senate from District 34, Alessandra Biagi. <laughs> so Alessandra is a Democratic Party candidate. Um, she's the second or third generation Italian immigrants, in fact, Pelo uh, Leader Pelosi said to her backstage, I went to Italy with your grandmother in right. 1981. <laughs> Such a great story. Yes. And after years of working in the governor's office and, and in many other ways of serving the people of the state of New York, decide to throw your own hat in the ring, run for office, run against a 24-year incumbent who outspends you 11 to 1, and you win by 10 points. That's right. Yeah. Pretty good beginning, uh, middle Excellent and now beginning. you're on the home stretch, Alessandra. Right. How are you feeling and uh, what have you learned so far? So I don't know if you can, if you can hear my mic, but um, I've learned um, a lot of things, but I think one of the most important things that I've learned is that as soon as you realize the thing that you want to go for, you're going to be met with resistance, right? Resistance from the, the powers that may be. And so as soon as I decided to run, I was told no so many, probably more times than I have ever been told no in my life. Um, I was told no, it's not your turn, which is I think a, something that women hear a lot. I was told no, he's too powerful, you'll never raise any money, you'll have no volunteers, nobody will vote for you. Um, some of my favorites which were you'll never have a job in state government again, to which I said well that's actually great, so where can I sign, for, <laughs> sign up for that? That doesn't sound like a punishment. Um, but as soon as I realized why this was happening, I just said no, I am doing this because I'm going to take my turn. Nobody's, I'm not going to wait for somebody to anoint me or choose me. I have got to step up and I saw a problem in in my community and I wanted to fix it by running for office. And so that's why I did that. What, what I love too is, is how energetic and enthusiastic you are at this point in the campaign. <laughs> I know, I was very tired. Usually when people are like, please, do I have to talk? No, we, we have great confidence in you, Alessandra. Thank you. So I'm not going in any particular order because I'm going to come to this amazing young woman sitting next to me, Brittany Packnett. Uh, Brittany was once described by President Barack Obama as a leader whose voice is going to make a difference for years to come. And there is no question that you've been doing that. I think number three on Politico's most influential people in politics, that takes a little bit getting there, um, <laughs> and, and so many organizations that have been a part of your work as an educator and activist. Um, I'm particularly interested in Rise to Run and what, what, how has that impacted bringing more women, more women of color, more women from different communities uh, into the political arena? Well, first of all, it's, it's so incredible to be here and to have such a timely conversation. I'm really honored to be a part of this with such an incredible group of women. Um, you know, in, in 2016, I decided to do the thing that they tell organizers and activists never to do. I endorsed a candidate uh, in the presidential election, in part because I could see the writing on the wall. 
And so uh, I endorsed Hillary, and, and even though things did not work out the way that I wanted them to, I met so many incredible organizers and leaders and operatives, um, and women in particular, who had thrown their work and their effort into the ring uh, during that process. And I, I, one of those women was Helen Bronson. And so after everybody was kind of done licking their wounds and, and you know having those mournful days, which I think all of us had, um, we, she, she called me and she said, hey, I want to talk to you about an idea. Um, and I was all, in that moment, I was all about ideas. I was like, give me all of the ideas because right now there is nothing to do but work. We have to get up off the mat. We have to get back to work. Um, and so we, we met over a margarita. And uh, <laughs> she, right, she, um, she told me about this idea of Rise to Run. And she said she wants to make sure that as a millennial woman, she is doing her part to recruit other women to run for office and that the people that we recruit together are as diverse as the world that we want to live in and that our process is as inclusive as the world we want to live in. So making sure that our our board and our mentors and the candidates that we help support and the women that we um, engage in the process um, actually represent this world, right? So we go hard after progressive women of color. We go hard after progressive women from marginalized backgrounds, whether that means you're an immigrant, whether that means you're disabled, you're a part of the LGBTQ community. We want to make sure that you have the support, the resources, the backing and the encouragement to run so that stories like yours, mm -hmm. quite frankly, are not heard, right? That we can right. get to the point where people aren't telling you yeah. you can't do it, but where people are celebrating the fact that you can do it um, and that you've decided to do it. So Rise to Run is, is wants to be a part of the equation to actually fixing the world and creating the world we want to live in. So in many ways, you're responsible for those 43,000 women running for office this year. Oh, I can't take credit for <laughs> all but, of but, them. But, uh. <laughs> but many, many more women from yes. diverse backgrounds, experiences, religions, cultures Absolutely. than have run in this country before. And it's so encouraging to hear you at, as a millennial. Are you you're still in Yes, I'm, I'm right on the bubble. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, after the last election, there was so much concern about millennials and would they come back into yeah. the process after their vast disappointment about the race. How are you assessing where millennials are currently? Well, listen, I think that there's a conversation happening about millennials, and I want to include Gen Zers because there are millions of young people who are turning 18 right now. Um, maybe we got a few right here. Yeah. Um, uh, but there's a conversation about our generations that calls us apathetic. And I think that we have to caution ourselves against that. Um, we are fully engaged in the political process. We just might not be engaged in ways that are traditional. We see our opportunity to craft the world that we want to live in, yes, at the voting booth, but on the streets and protest and creating our own organizations and using social media and new media to get our, our words across and art. Um, in so many different ways, we are making our voices heard. The question is not whether or not millennials and Gen Zers are going to be active in the political process because we already are. The question is, are you giving us something to believe in? Because I know a lot of folks who said, I don't know if I actually have a candidate or a party that makes me want to get out and go cast my vote for them, but I will go march, I will go organize, I will go knock on doors. Um, and so I think it really behooves political institutions to make sure that they are um, having enough daring to imagine the world as it can be and not simply operating in the status quo of the world as it is. Because I can tell you right now, millennials and Gen Zers are not going to get on that train. That's right. And that says everything about the need to change leadership in a lot of places. And what did you say earlier, a, a vision? Oh, I heard, I heard uh, Reverend William Barber say this. Yes. Uh, you don't just, you need more than a villain, you need a vision. That's right. You so need more than a villain. So it can't just be about getting someone out of office. It can't just be about a certain party not being in power. You have to give me something to believe in. Don't just tell me what to say no to. Give me something to say yes to. And that is where we are in yeah. politics in this country today. So much about uh, for, uh, against rather than for. And, and I'm looking at you, uh, Dr. Carrie Healy, not just because you're wearing red. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and you were the Republican Lieutenant Governor of the state of Massachusetts. And I want to thank you for being here with us. And you were the co-founder uh, with Swanee Hunt, a, a political parody 
whose whole point was, let's reach across the aisle, let's talk to each other, let's find the vision that makes this a better country, one in which we can all live in and feel our values and lives are respected. So how did you take what you learned running for office, serving as a lieutenant governor of a state, and now the first woman president of a college, Babson College is lucky enough. I can't believe you're the first woman president. Thank you. <laughs> I'm also the 13th. It sounds better to be the first. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, it, it's long as, as long as you're there. Yeah. But how are you taking that into what, what feels like the most divided political time that we've perhaps ever experienced? Well, I think I was very fortunate coming out of politics in 2012 and going into a, a, an, an enforced neutral environment. I, I went into academia and I wasn't going to be allowed to talk about partisan politics for the next six years. My time is almost up, by the way. I leave in May. <laughs> so, but, so, so it actually made me have to stand back and say, okay, how can I, how can I still be impactful? What can I accomplish that I care about? As, but not in that partisan zone. And I think it was a time that actually gave me the ability to really grow because it allowed me to, for example, uh, interact with Swanee Hunt, who w actually had campaigned against me and raised money against me when I ran for governor. Um, and we came together around the very simple idea that we weren't seeing women rise up in equal numbers to, to be in office, and there was something wrong that often women were being pitted against each other across the aisle. The Democratic women were criticizing Republican women, and Republican women were denigrating uh, Democratic women, and we realized that, that separated, we were never going to actually reach parity. And so we started to bring together all of the various women's groups across the aisle, trying to let them see each other, let them see each other as humans, and, and, and see what we had in common. So that was, a, that was a very powerful experience for me. And then right now, what I'm feeling, I, I am uh, the type of person who has never actually belonged properly in either party. I am a, a, a Republican from Massachusetts. So that means that I, there are two other people who agree with me uh, in my state. And, um, and, and it means that I'm socially moderate or possibly even liberal, but I'm also conservative economically, perhaps in foreign policy. And as, as this, this new political wave has been rolling out across the country, more and more women like me who were in the Republican Party uh, or still are technically in the Republican Party are feeling disenfranchised are feeling pushed out, um, and, and they're looking for something more moderate. And, and they, they want to embrace uh, the social change that's happening in the country, and they do care uh, about the poor, and they do care about immigration, and they do care about these things, and they don't have a home. And so I've just <coughs> launched uh, uh, what I hope will become a movement, but only a couple weeks ago, so please don't, <laughs> you know, don't Google it yet, because you won't <laughs> find much, uh, called uh, Millions in the Middle. And brought together all the bipartisan, nonpartisan, good government, pro democracy, and center right and center left groups I could in the same room to start discussing what, what is that substance? What is it that brings us together that can be groundbreaking, that can be different than, than what we've been talking about on the left and the right? Because we don't need to simply take the dregs of what's left over after people rush to the left and rush to the right. We can actually build something very progressive and new in the middle, and I think that that's gonna to appeal to a lot of women. So how's that going? So far, so good, honestly. I, I, I'm actually stunned by how many people say, I wanna volunteer for this, I wanna be a part of this, I want to, to do this. And I'm also stunned at how many people are working in silos especially around pro-democracy movements, good mm -hmm. government movements. Mm -hmm. We were just talking yes. about gerrymandering. You know, people That's will right. talk to me passionately about abolishing gerrymandering <laughs> or ranked choice voting, yes. you know, and, and, and uh, like the fact that we as a country are now passionate about protecting our democracy mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing. Well, I wanna come back and talk about what do we do with all those millions in the middle? Mm -hmm. Because that, that clearly mm -hmm. could be the different uh, deciding factor. And I think there's a lot of women in that middle. Come, speaking of that, women, I wanna to go to Simone Sanders, who as a young woman just sort of blew everybody's <clears throat> mind and how amazing uh, she was and how much she understood about all the issues. And she, uh, like Bridget, went to the Harvard Institute of politics uh, and 
there brought her wisdom as a political <coughs> strategist and a communications director, and was the youngest press secretary in history as the press secretary to <laughs> Bernie Sanders. <coughs> You two give me hope, uh, I gotta say. Um, but there's so many w questions that are on my mind, Simone, but I, and I don't wanna look backward as much as forward, but, but, I, do, <laughs> but I do think there, there must be things that we take from that last election and what you saw very up close and personal, the disaffection, uh, the people in the middle, the everyone kind of looking for something that they could believe in and hold on to and vote for. Um, how are you assessing that now? Where would I think all of the folks, um, I think a number, I, I, so I'd like to remind people that since 2016, uh, the folks that have felt like they're in the middle or they didn't have a home or pe young people who have felt disaffected and maybe disenfranchised by the social process have made conscious efforts and decisions Oh, it is. I've been hooked another way. People have made a conscious effort to get engaged and get involved, and that's, I mean, to be honest, that's how Stacey Abrams won um, the Democratic primary for the governor's race in Georgia. That's how Andrew Gillum won the Democratic primary for the governor's race in Florida. That is, that is why um, re-enfranchising of voting rights for millions of people is on the ballot right now in Florida for this November 6th election. Like, you have seen, that's how... You will be the next day senator from, you know, I'm just saying. So <laughs> folks have made a conscious effort to get engaged and get involved in various ways at various levels um, across the country. So I think they have seen that, that our participation can make a difference um, and that voting actually has to be a key part of that participation. There are many people that stayed home uh, in 2016, whether they were young people, whether they were um, folks that maybe voted for Obama in 2012 but decided they didn't want to cast a ballot for anybody in 2016. Maybe there were people that went to the polls but didn't decide to check the top of the ticket. And I think all of those people are seeing that um, perhaps we should have participated. <laughs> and maybe I'm going to participate this time around. So I am actually hopeful. What I'm concerned about is the rhetoric. You know, I, I'm very blessed and very happy to be a CNN political commentator. Um, and I, I, I enjoy the, the CNN family. But what I do, what, what concerns me is the rhetoric um, that folks have about our current state of political affairs. As though the extreme that you see on some folks on the right, not good conservatives, Okay, like the former lieutenant governor over here, but like extreme, the extreme rhetoric we see on the right, and we're equating that with um, folks who feel like their lives are literally under attack. Mm -hmm. People who are literally living in fear. I don't know what it's like to walk out of my house out of fear that I will be snatched from the street and deported, mm -hmm. or that my mother, or that my kids, or that my brother will be snatched from the street and deported. I do know what it feels like to be a black woman and go to the airport. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so there is a real, um, I think, the, I think we have to be very intentional about the way we engage when it comes to media and how we have to be sure not to equate what is happening um, on quote unquote both sides. That there's really, there's, there's a real unrest of you know, the, the white working class in America. But there's also a real unrest of the rest of the working class It's not just white. That is not the same as the neo-Nazis picking up torches in Charlottesville and marching on the street. Mm -hmm. right. 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 Um, And that unrest, blessed unrest as some people have called it, uh, really is driving so much of the politics and so much of the media. And then of course there's who, the, the media as a driver itself of the conversation. And you try and keep that rational on CNN. I tried that, I tried um, And um, Alessandra and I were talking earlier too because it's one of the big challenges for all candidates to figure out how to navigate the press, which is clearly a player. And, and what do you respond to and what do you donate? For women candidates, it is especially challenging, uh, Alessandra. And it, and it remains to be challenging. I think one of the things that I've learned is that I want to be the type of leader, take away candidate, take away state senator, take away any, anything, leader that is not reacting but is responding. And I think that's an incredibly important distinction because um, reacting is that you know everything will, 
you will respond, you will, or excuse me, you will react to every single stimulus, right, that comes along. And really, not everything that tries to bait you deserves our attention. In fact, a lot of it is to throw you off your center. And as a first-time candidate, there were, I, I had more thrown at me than I can possibly share with you. Elected officials mm. screaming things in the streets at me, in fact, screaming shame um, and, uh, uh, through a bullhorn and just the most ridiculous things. And so what it made me realize was that the more of that that started to happen, right, the more um, pushback and the more negativity that started to come at me was really um, an opportunity for me to say, wow, actually, we are doing something right here because they're afraid, um, and we just need to keep our center and, and keep our focus and make sure that we are having our eye on the prize, which is to win, right, and to bring that positivity, right? One of the things that I shared with my team, and I still do, is that when you knock on somebody's door or you're interacting with a voter, you don't want to be knocking on their door to ruin their dinner. You don't want to bring the parade of horribles to their home and say, let me tell you all the terrible things that are going on in our neighborhood and the reason why you should vote for me. And that's the, that, that's the four language, right, that we want. We want to give people something to, to get up and get excited about instead of you know, ruining the rest of their day. And I think that there's a lot to get mad about today. And so that's the thing that I think we try to do to distinguish us, really, from my opponent. So you've got a real political strategist and commentator sitting right next to you. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going <laughs> to put you on the spot, Simone. <laughs> yes. And what advice? Because we do want to make sure that everyone leaves here tonight knowing a little bit more about how we can, what it will take, mm -hmm. and what we can do to get there. So, what will it take for candidates and media? What in terms of that relationship? Well, you know, I think people, one, have to be willing to engage, um, but you also have to, to set your boundaries. So, so oftentimes, you know, I, I go on the Hill on a regular basis and I speak to um, the Democratic caucus in the House. I go to the messaging meeting and I'm like, y'all need to get on television. And they're like, oh, but we don't want to go on TV because everybody wants to talk about Russia. We would talk about the issues. <laughs> okay, well, you cannot be afraid to engage. Yes. You know, if, if, I've, if I've learned one thing in my short life is that if you don't tell your story, somebody else is going to tell your That's story right. for you. And I think for, for women <coughs> across the country, regardless of what side of the aisle you sit on, when you're engaging in the political arena, whether you're a candidate, whether you're someone that works for the candidates, whether you're somebody that helps fund and fuel and help put the candidates in good positions, we have to be willing to engage and we have to be willing to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. So we have to get out there and set the narrative early. Um, and when we don't set the narrative, we allow the narrative to be set for us. And you know, if, you know, if the lion is always telling the story and the zebra don't ever get to talk, yes. story's gonna always glorify the lion. You don't know That's what right. the zebra had going on. <laughs> I was reading Aesop earlier today, y'all. Don't ask me why. Like I, I, I thought that was so. the, the lion tells the story of the hunter. Or, okay. There we go. Whatever. Well, now it's the zebra, okay? Because the zebra is the most under. I like zebra better. Yeah. What, it, what, what Chino Achebe, yeah. how, how he would translate this. Um, bring me back, Brittany. Bring me back. Is that if, if, if history always. Um, uh, glorifies the hunter, then the lion will never be able to tell That's their story. That's right. Uh, Thank and I you think for that there's a straight. No problem. I got you. <laughs> um, but I but I think that this this relates to Simone's point about the voices of marginalized communities in particular, right? Mm -hmm. And this is why we cannot create a false equivalency. Mm -hmm. um, so often the false equivalency is, well, this side is just as bad as this side. It is different. To uh, so so first of all. First of all, <laughs> when you've always experienced privilege, well, right, equality feels like oppression to you. Mm -hmm. When in reality, it's actually just discomfort. What it actually is, is someone saying, you don't get to have the things that you didn't earn at my expense, mm -hmm. right? That's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. What folks in, 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 what people in marginalized communities are saying is, this is not about my political party. This is not about my beliefs. This is not about who I voted for. I am tired of people attacking my personhood, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what it means for the lion to tell their story, that if I am constantly under attack for my identity, okay. if you are telling me that I cannot go to the bathroom that matches my identity, if you are telling me that I cannot walk around safely in my neighborhood and the people who are supposed to serve and protect me are actually the ones who are the greatest threat to me, if that is how I have to live my life in America, yeah. then I am indeed the lion, and you cannot convince me um, that the hunter is constantly telling my story. You cannot convince me that what he is saying is okay. 
this is part of the reason why um, I'm really proud of the work that activists in Florida have done. So, so what Simone was referring to earlier, there are 1.5 million people in Florida who cannot vote because they were formerly incarcerated. Yeah. 1.5 million people. Naturally, it's about 6 million people. But 1.5 million of those people are in Florida alone. And it was a man named Desmond Mead who himself was one of those formerly incarcerated people who has led the fight to get the ballot initiative known as Amendment 4 onto the ballot. They had to get hundreds of thousands of signatures, um, and we supported them by mailing out petitions to registered Florida voters. But he himself didn't even have the franchise. But what did he say? He said, I cannot consistently have the hunter not only telling my story, but being the ones that I trust to go out there and vote for my interests. I need to be able to vote for my own interests and tell my own story. Um, and so they got that, ba that, ballot measure, uh, on, uh, that, that ballot measure on the ballot, but it's going to take 60% of the vote in Florida. Um, for that ballot measure to actually pass, in Florida, mind you. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is going to be a real challenge, but over and over and over again, we keep seeing that folks who are marginalized, who are pushed down by society, who are forgotten, saying enough is enough, and I'm not gonna not only not let you tell my story, um, I'm not gonna let you determine my future. I'm gonna take control of that. I think that's why so many women um, this year put their names on the ballot across the country, honestly. I think some of it was <laughs> folks saw Donald Trump get elected and they say, well, hell, if he can, <laughs> the least I can do is put my name on the ballot. That's right. But I think the second part of it, I mean, literally. And I think the second part of it, though, was um, that so, so often women in communities across the country are the ones um, that we come in and we get the job done. Women will be the ones that come in, we come to the table, we will come to the board meeting, the community meeting, the school board, the, the PTA, wherever it is, we, the corporate boardroom, wherever it is we have to go on, we will get the job done. We're gonna pull people in, we're gonna sit them down and we'll have the conversation. We have been doing that in our communities for years. So, so many people, I think, this cycle woke up and said, how about I do that for America? Right. But you know what's different, Pat? You, you keep asking the question, what, what's it gonna take, mm -hmm. right? What's it gonna take? It's going to take people like you, young people like you, who can tell your story authentically. Mm -hmm. And you all are doing that again and again. And you're enabling other people to tell your stories authentically. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the things that's kept women from reaching the, the levels that they could in, in politics in the past is that whenever they tried to speak authentically, they were criticized. Mm -hmm. And they were criticized in the way that you were, with a bullhorn, yes. mm -hmm. you know, shame screamed right. at you. And so women encase themselves in this attempt to be perfect in an attempt not to be criticized. Mm -hmm. And you can't have charisma and you can't have influence mm -hmm. if you aren't telling mm -hmm. your story authentically. Mm -hmm. And people would look at them and say, you look plastic, you don't stand for anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know who you are, so I don't trust you. I don't even like you and I can't vote for you. Mm -hmm. right? But your generation of women <clears throat> are telling your stories, you're being authentic, and you will be elected because people will know who you are and they'll respect you. Right. You get That's elected. That's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I want to just comment on this too. Because, yeah. you know, what, a lot of, I think, and the resistance that I received when I decided to run too, it came from an experience of trying to pass laws that affect women's health in New York State. Mm -hmm. And so I came off the 2016 election, I decide, I'm a lawyer, I decided, all right, I'm going to use my law degree to work for the governor of New York and I'm going to help to pass bills. And I have this women's health portfolio and I get this bill called the Reproductive Health Act and I say, okay, well, you know, what's the Reproductive Health Act? Well, it would codify Roe v. Wade and it would protect women's health and I say to myself, how could it be, right? And why are more people not screaming about this in the street mm -hmm. that in New York State, where we have more Democrats than Republicans, where clearly these are the things that we want to fight for, that this is not the law. And it didn't pass. And the louder I got after it didn't pass, people were like, oh, honey, this is Albany. Are you kidding? Like, it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. then, I, then I got surrogacy, right? That was my next thing to work on. And surrogacy is illegal in New York State. And I thought, you know, if this was something that affected uh, men on a day-to-day -day basis, these things would be the law. And also, there are not that many women in our state legislature. And we just need to be literally running to the tables and taking the seats and sitting there because with more women and more female voices, our voices and our, and our interests and the policy we care about that affect our lives will be heard. And so I realized that my work could not actually be you know, fulfilled in this role, and I had to run against the person who was blocking these things, who was a Democrat, a Democrat, a turncoat Democrat. But the point is, I realized that 
you know, nobody was going to tell me, you know, you go. It's time for you to go. It's no, important. Nobody's, nobody's ever going to tell you that. Nobody's going to give us permission. Nobody's going to give us permission. So what's it going to take? Ever. It's awesome. I'm, I'm getting your bullet points in, Pat. Good. I'm like, no, I'm, Good. I'm, I know you I'm run a tight ship. I'm coming ship. right to you, okay. Florida. So what is it going to take? It's going to take for That's women it. across the country to stop yeah. waiting for permission. That's yeah. right. Stop waiting on someone to pick you. Because yeah. for so long, folks were told, if you just put your head down, you do the work, you raise your That's hand, right. people will recognize your work. No, they won't. Mm -mm. Or they'll see it. And they'll say, she's doing a really good job and we're still gonna go over here. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna take us not to wait for permission. It's also gonna take us to redefine what we think is normal. For so long after 2016, I was one of the people that you know, kept reminding people that this is not normal. Right. Um, and, cause it's not. No. But also, like, what is in fact normal? Cause at one point in time, it was normal in this country for women not to be able to vote. Mm -hmm. At one point in time in this country, Jim Crow was normal. Yeah. And it was acceptable. So for what they told you, mm -hmm. this is Albany, this is what's normal. We need to stop talking about what's normal and start thinking about what's possible. That's right. Yeah. And what's yeah. possible yeah. is what's going to help you know, change the tide across the country. Okay, so let, let's shift the narrative to what's possible. And now we get there. Because yeah. we really do want to send everybody out <laughs> believing that, that there's a lot of possibility. And, and I'm, I'm currently living in the state of Georgia where we have this extraordinary woman mm -hmm. Uh, running the governor, and if she gets elected, be the first woman in Georgia and be the first African-American governor in this country. And someone introducing her recently said to a large group, um, okay, here's what it's going to take. White women get out of the way. Yes, Black so <laughs> women are ready to lead. It is time for communities of color. So, so to be clear, black women have always been leading. Um, yep. <laughs> which is... Which is important because if black women hadn't always been leading, you wouldn't have Doug Jones. You wouldn't have, um, you wouldn't have a, a great progress in the feminist movement. You wouldn't have the Women's March um, because there were a ton of black women behind that and a ton of women of color behind that um, who often are, are just not a part of the narrative. Um, and, and this is actually what I was thinking as you were asking this question, what is it going to take? It's going to take us being truly intersectional in our approach. Because it's just not gonna work um, for some women to have certain franchise and certain access and certain power and other women not to. That doesn't actually mean all women are doing this, which means that we have to stop conversations like all women make 78 cents to the dollar. No, they don't, white women do, right? We actually have to have accurate conversations about all of the different intersectional ways oppression exists. Um, and therefore, once we are truthful about those things, we can get real about the solutions. Um, and so part of the solutions are, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily say white women get out of the way. I would say white women go work on other white women. Like there is work for privileged people to do. You can applaud for that, it's cool. Um, there is work for white people to do, there is work for white women to do, there is work for white men to do, there is work for cisgender yep. people to do, there is work for Christians to do, and the work for people with privilege to do is go talk to people who also share your privilege and get them together. Right. Like, yep. if you have an uncle that voted for Trump, then it is your job to go and get your uncle together. <laughs> like, it is your job yeah. to go and have the uncomfortable conversation <laughs> over the Thanksgiving table and be like, so here are all the reasons, Uncle Joe, why I have a problem with the way you voted, and here are all of the things that have been done by this administration that I don't stand for, and I don't understand how you stand for them either, right? Mm -hmm. It's your job to go and ask the questions when somebody thinks that it is okay for voter ID to be the law of so many states, right? Ask them why they think that's okay and keep asking them why, keep asking them why until they get to the point where they start to unravel their own racist thinking, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. That is the only way that we're actually going to get out. So I don't want white women to get out of the way. I want you to go work on your own people. Mm -hmm. That's what I want you to do. And, and I want white women and women of color to work together, right? Because if we don't, I, I mean, I don't think we can have what we really think is secure victory. So how are we gonna do that? You're trying to do it by putting to together I, people and, and in I'm the middle. I'm trying to actually bring together some of those white women who feel disenfranchised right now, who feel mm -hmm. like neither party is speaking to them, or, or that there are certainly um, those among the Republicans. You, mm -hmm. you can see in the polling right now that something like 80% of college-educated white women, many of whom are married, who were Republican, mm -hmm just can't support mm -hmm. the president. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, and, and so what are they doing? What, where do they fit in? 
you know, because they may not fit into that narrative yeah. that, that you were just describing, but they believe in the country. They, they're, yeah. they're very patriotic. They want to contribute. They, yeah, they, they support figured them. out the patriarchy is not for them either. And, and, right. and they are deciding that yeah, there are but, things but that they care about and are they want to fight for. Are those numbers reflected in, <laughs> so, in, the, oh. in the, all the surveys and polls yes, following the yeah, Kavanaugh? it is. It, it's, it's coming out now that there's a real schism, unfortunately, you know, but, you know in, in the Repu Republican Party between uh, women and men. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is going to be this middle space that's filling up. And, mm -hmm. and I would like to see it focused on bringing human dignity back to the core of our public policy discussions mm -hmm. so that we look both to the left and to the right and question the policies that are being proposed from the standpoint of is it maximizing each individual's human dignity? Mm -hmm. Is it making every vote count? Are we being true to our democratic principles? And I think that that's something that, that can help recenter us. It can put out some of the fire and the anger on both the left and the right and make us recognize that which is human in each of us, which has value. Mm -hmm. And that's really where we need to get to in America. We need to bring ourselves back together again and recognize each other's humanity and honor it in our proposals mm -hmm. that we talk about every day. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push a little bit because I, I wholeheartedly agree with the aspiration for human dignity. I do think that there are a lot of people out there who never thought that we were one and who never felt a oneness in this country. Um, and this is what I mean about the importance of marginalized voices, um, because there are folks who are saying, you know, it is unfortunate that with this administration, so many more people are feeling disenfranchised, but also welcome to my world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I've been feeling this for a very, very long time. My dignity has not been recognized by previous administrations, right? Far before 2016, there are just a lot but of people until, who now have until permission your dignity, to express that. Until your dignity is recognized, oh, I wholeheartedly agree we with cannot that. unify. I wholeheartedly so, agree So with that. that's where we have to go. It's not suggesting that many people haven't been experiencing this for sure. a long time, but to the extent that we have institutional policies that just as a matter of course, diminish the dignity of people Absolutely. on the left and the right, we have to abandon and d identify those policies and find better ones that bring us together. I, think, I agree with that. I also, and then I think this also poses a, a tough question for people, for, for, for these folks that, clearly I'm not somebody in the middle, y'all. I think y'all know where I'm at. But for these people that are in the middle, I think it poses the question of, yes, there are policies and ideals we can come together on, but when it comes time for an electoral strategy, what does this mean for people that are in the middle? Like, I think elections are, uh, elections have consequences, but elections are also about choices. Mm -hmm. And the question I think, I think that many people are trying to answer right now, and maybe if I had the answer, we'd all, we'd all be rich. We'd be out here, doctor, we'd be out here. Um, what do we, what, what is the electoral strategy for those people in the middle? Like, I'm thinking about folks in the middle that m live in Georgia right now. Like, are they, are they gonna cast their ballot for Stacey Abrams? Or are they gonna cringe and check the box for Brian Kemp? Or are they gonna go to the polls and vote down ballot or up ballot, but not click the, check the top of the ballot? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know, because I mean, I'm, I'm a Democrat, I'm a progressive. I don't want everybody to be a progressive or a Democrat. We need conservatives. We need people in the middle, we need independence. But when it comes to electorally, when there are policies on the table that are, in, that are literally, Tearing, tearing apart the souls of our communities. Mm -hmm. And when there are people who are backing these policies and we have the opportunity to remove them, mm -hmm. what do the folks in the middle do? I don't know. Can, mm. can I then throw out something? Um, may, may, so may I, I respond? Yeah, yeah, yes, of course, but, <laughs> but quickly, because I have very, some... very quickly. Um, <laughs> I, I think that both parties either have to make room for those people who are more moderate within their spaces, mm -hmm. or there will be a third party. Okay, and that's where I'm going. And both parties are going to have to deal with that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, that's where I'm going. All right, so we, we, we tried it a couple of times <laughs> in, in history, and it's never worked. <laughs> and, and the prevailing wisdom is you got to have the candidate, as we did with, with Sanders, who wasn't independent, but was sort of independent. You said we weren't going to go back that now. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going forward. Uh, <laughs> so forward thinking, I'm looking around the world and I'm seeing something interesting happen in the UK mm -hmm. and Spain mm -hmm. and, and France and other places. Women's Equality Party. Women are saying in these countries, doesn't work over here on the right or on the left, and what we really care about is equality, period. And the intersectionality of all of these issues come lining up together, and that's what we're going to vote for. And I've heard it proposed, maybe that's, that's where we are, that that's what it's going to take. What do you think? 
Can I just comment on that? Because in New York State, we actually have a women's equality party, and oh. it's confusing to a lot of people. Um, because when you go into the voting booth, you would think, oh, this must mean that Are they this, on the ballot? They're on the in ballot, the, yes. And so this must mean that this party is representative of all the things that I care about as a woman who wants equal wages and affordable child care and you know, equal access to health care, except it doesn't necessarily mean that. And so I think that if we're going to do that at the national level, then it has to be very clear um, what it represents. Uh, because in New York State, it has generally been um, a party that has been created by the governor here, which is all fine and good, oh. um, except that it has historically endorsed the incumbent um, establishment candidate, and that's a problem, right? For the people in the middle, they're generally not the established incumbent candidate. And so mm -hmm. it's actually marginalized, it's done the opposite of what I think the intention of the party would be to do at the national level, which is that it's actually pushed out yeah, I People wasn't suggesting necessarily yeah. the Women's <laughs> Equality Party, but a third party. Well, so so, so yeah. my, my, my view here is that, that partisanship trumps gender every time. Mm. So the idea of having some sort of gathering politically around gender is just not going to work. We've polled it, we've looked at it, mm. And, and peop women, as you can see right here on this, on this panel, feel very passionately about their partisan beliefs. And they value their, their identity as a woman, but that's not going to be the political driver. And because there you isn't really do, you Well, really I think that's true for, I just want to be frank, yeah. I think that's true for non-melanated women. I think that, I think that's true for white women, I really that's do. Fair. I think that we have seen across the board how women of color will choose they will choose being a woman of color before a party. If women of color across the board, um, if, if, if partisanship trumped gender, mm -hmm. any, I, I honestly think that Hillary Clinton the, the would be president. Would be right now. She'd that's be right. president right now. She's not president. So I don't think that's true. I think that's something to unpack there about what is it about a certain subset of women that their partisanship trumps who they are to the point where they will support policies that are and, that interests. are the opposite right. of what it is right. that they stand for. Well, I don't understand that because if the Democratic Party tries any of this stuff that the <laughs> Republicans have tried, I'm out. <laughs> I'm gonna still be on TV though, but I'm out. But I mean, we, but women, women are voting are against their own out. best that's interests. That's my point. So I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm, that's what I'm saying is women are opting out. But you don't think a just a but a, a, a let's get in formation would work? No. Okay. <laughs> What do you think, She's Brittany? Yeah. I, uh, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I find myself, um, I've had lots of conversations with folks in the Democratic Party wishing, hoping, praying, begging for us to just have some imagination about something. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know when we stopped being the party that was willing to dare, right? Like, there was a time when I, I felt a sense of pride in, in the party because we weren't always saying no to something. We were saying yes to things. We were saying yes to people. We were saying yes to new ideas. We, we had enough audacity to dream, um, enough so that we, like, put a black man in the White House, which uh, lots of people just thought would never happen. Um, and no, he wasn't perfect, but he was unbelievable at a certain time. And for a long time, we were willing to do the unbelievable thing. And I think what people are looking for, probably from, from multiple angles, or I don't know how Republican women think, I just don't know. Um, um, but, I, but I think that lots of people are looking for parties and leadership in those parties to simply have some daring. And I haven't, I haven't heard that, quite frankly, in a long time from, from most people who are running for office, from most people who are political operatives, from most people who are running any party. Um, and that is deeply disappointing. Like, that is painful. Yeah. Because right now is the time that we need dreamers. Like, right now is the time that we need people who are willing to imagine. I do not know where we would be if Dr. King had not been willing to dream. Like, I do not know where we would be if Harriet Tubman did not actually think, no, we can be free no matter what everything in life is telling us. Yes. I do not know where we would be if Cesar Chavez had not said, we actually can have equity for people who are working and tilling our land. I do not know where we would be if Rosa Parks hadn't dared to actually sit on that bus. We need people with daring, and I don't know if they're coming in any party, but I frankly don't care about 
what party they come from. I just need them to exist. Yeah. Well, they exist. You're sitting right here. You're sitting right here. You're sitting right here. You're sitting right here. And. And uh, all, of all of us, Alessandra is the only one who's thrown her hat in the ring who's actually doing it. <laughs> lead by the front, Alessandra, lead. To the daring part of it, I think, uh, to be honest, I think so much of it, and you know, what will it take? It will take also removing money from politics because a huge That's barrier right. for right. entry is how much money you have to raise. I mean, it's no small thing that we were outspent 11 to 1. 11 yeah. to 1 on a yeah. state senate race yeah. is crazy. My opponent spent more than the other Democratic candidate for governor yeah, in yeah. the state of New York. That's insane. And so when you think about that, but I mean, we won. but we won and we won, yeah. right? Because because what I was bringing to people wasn't the parade of horribles, but it was this is possible, right? This is what That's we can right. do. Yeah. Because the when you look at the world, right, everything's a thought form, right? It came from someone's mind, which means that actually anything is possible, but the powers that be don't want you to think that. And so I feel like my role in this take away the party, is actually hoping to elicit this in other people who say, you know what, I don't like the way that things are going. Mm -hmm. I don't like when you know we have racism in our communities or sexism at the table or wherever I may be. And I'm going to push back against that, even if it means being the only one standing there. And I feel like having gone through this process, which is a fire, it's like walking through the fire, that it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't even matter because at the end of the day, this seat is not so important to me to lose my values. I yes. don't care about the seat that much to lose who I am and I think those are the type of people that we need. We actually yeah. like, we need some folks who are willing to run and not not be running for re-election yeah, the day right. that they take the oath of office. Like that's, that's right. really what we need. Mm, we yeah. need folks who are willing to get fired because they are willing to be that daring. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's and, awesome. And it's, I mean we have more women and more people of color and and we have more diversity in our candidate race than we than we've ever had and hopefully some of them will win and take those yeah. values in. But it's going to take all of us doing mm -hmm. something in a different way than we've done it before, right? It's Absolutely. going to take organizing, yeah. like you're organizing, like you're organizing. What what else is it going to take? We've got each each of us one more chance at answering this question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's what's it going to take? I think I think it's going. You, you hit the nail on the head. It's going to take us willing to do something that we haven't been done before. It's going to take us identifying um, a lane we want to play in because I think there's so much happening regardless of uh, where you sit on the ideological spectrum. There's, mm -hmm. there's something you can do. And I think if each of us just pick one thing right. yeah. and then attack that one thing, right. set a goal for that one thing, achieve it, then pick another thing, then we'll be able to get it done. But um, doing the things that haven't been done before requires us to be uncomfortable. That's right. It requires us to speak up where we usually wouldn't speak up. It requires us to go some places we would not usually go. Mm -hmm. It requires us to talk to some folks we don't usually talk to. It requires us to give some money where we usually don't give money. Mm -hmm. It requires us to give some money where we usually don't give money, okay? Mm -hmm. It requires you to get uncomfortable. And far too many of us don't really want to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, if you want to see change, change is uncomfortable. Yeah. If it was easy, we like it wouldn't be so hard to get. That's right. Yep. I think two very practical things. One is that every time we spend time telling someone to register to vote or to show up to vote, we have to keep that same energy for fighting voter suppression. Yeah. There yes. are yes. so many times, there's so many young people that I know who show up and the polling place is closed yep. mm -hmm. and the hours have changed yep. or their ID doesn't count. Um, there's so, or you know, we see what happened to this. I'm forgetting the state, but we see what happened to this woman who did not even know about the laws in against for, in Texas against formerly incarcerated people voting. She showed up as a citizen to raise her voice, and because she was formerly incarcerated, is going to spend five years right. in jail for casting a vote. All because she didn't know. Yes, it's a true story. Go look. It it's just happened. Years. Like the my Wall Street executive Five still years. haven't been to jail for what Five they did years. to the economy. And That's so really here we so here we are. So here we are telling people vote, 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 vote. But if I show up and I'm turned away, or I'm shown up, or, or I show up when I'm shut down, or I show up and I spend five years in jail from that, yeah. there are lots of people who are gonna go back and retreat in their corners. Right. And not only are they not gonna vote this time, they're not going to vote for years to come. And so we have to play the long game here, because those folks who got Brett Kavanaugh on the court, they were playing the long game. We need to play the long game here. 
And we need to be very clear that the same kind of energy we are spending in engaging voters, new voters, re-enfranchised voters, we need to be spending on fighting voter suppression. You live in Georgia, 53,000 yep. people flagged according to an exact match rule mm -hmm. that was created by the same man who's running for governor, Brian yes. Kemp. 70% of those votes, well, 70% 70 of those registrations, rather, Democrat. belong to African-American people, right? And they're Democrats, yeah. right? So this is like a clear mm -hmm. game, that, a game to them, but it's our lives at stake. And so yeah. we have to be very serious about both ends of that coin. I think the other really practical piece is to never, ever, 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 ever stop telling the truth. That's like, people keep saying that we are in a post-truth world. I don't believe that. Because the world will only be post-truth if we let it, if yeah. we stop telling the truth. I don't care what they're saying, sorry, Simone, on TV. I don't care what they're saying in the newspaper. If we know the truth, then it is our responsibility to tell it. And we have no excuse. We have social media at our fingertips. We have outlets like Medium at our fingertips. We have all of those Facebook arguments we have all the time at our fingertips. We have the, the dinner table, yeah. we have the water cooler. We have so many opportunities to keep telling the truth. If we stop telling the truth, that is the day we will lose. Absolutely. Carrie, one last one. Simone is right. It's money. Women need to write the check. Women yep. have not written the check in the past, and that's yep. why they didn't, didn't have power. That's right. They never wrote the check. Right. So we've got to do that. We're always stuffing envelopes. We're mm -hmm. always helping out. Mm -hmm. We're always holding the yep. sign. Yep. We're never writing the check. Yep. We weren't on the right end. So that's absolutely important. Mm -hmm. And then, Alessandra, I think you're right. You, you have to imagine. We have to ask uh, young people right now to imagine the world they want to live in. And what would be the policies? What would be the structure? What would it look like? We have to reimagine what we want America to look like. We don't want it to look like this. Yeah. It has to look like something new. Yeah. And, and so the young people, the young voters, are the people who have to reimagine America and then invest in that and find candidates who can articulate those visions. Right. And so my last thing is I think there has to be generation skipping. I think that honestly we may need to go to this next generation of younger candidates and say it's your time. Mm -hmm. It's your time to do it and get behind them so that people won't won't really be thinking about who's next right. in terms mm -hmm. of seniority. Mm -hmm. right. I think you have to say who's next in terms of talent and passion. That's right. Mm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Simone, the last word. Simone? I think oh, I said my piece. I, I just wanted to, okay. The last thing that I'll I'm gonna say, let the kid to get the last <laughs> word. Money. Money, money. Uh, yeah, yes, yes yeah. money for sure, right? That's why we need campaign finance reform and all that good stuff and voting reform in New York State, especially, because there is voter suppression in New York yeah. State. During yeah. the primary, there was voter suppression. People's voting records were thrown out in the pri in the primary in New York State. People who have voted for 50 years in some instances, roads were blocked, they were told to go to different places. Um, it was really alarming and it felt like it, we were not actually in a democracy, it felt mm -hmm. crazy. Um, but one of the things that I feel very committed to that I'm excited about is also, it's gonna take, like what we're all saying, really reaching down and identifying the talent mm -hmm. that's there, but also eliciting the idea or the belief that you can do it too, right? Because politics affects all of us. Even if you, I've met so many people who say, you know, but I don't do politics or I don't vote and it drives me crazy. And so I say, okay, well, see that banana that you're eating? That banana is political, right? There was a political decision that's made right. behind mm -hmm. that banana. Yeah. And the air that you're breathing, that's also political, right? So we cannot sit back because before you know it, you'll be drinking things that kill you and then you're dead or your family will get sick. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, I mean, this is... But not, not the parade of horrible, 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 campaign commercial. Let's go with this one right here. Right, right. Rainbows. I spend my time thinking about the young people who don't talk politics at the dinner table because yeah. it's taboo. It's not taboo. We need to talk about it everywhere. And right. so I want to use this role, if elected in November, to talk to young people to say, you might not think about running for district leader or dog catcher or whatever role it is in your town or school president, but you should because if you don't do it, somebody else is and they're going to decide how your whole life looks. And it's mm -hmm. up to you. So it's up to us. And everybody has to start from the ground up. And I think the next generation is the generation that's going to take this and actually take it over the finish line. And we might not see the results of the work that we're all putting in here today, but it is worth it and we've got to do it. But otherwise, we have a world that looks like this, and this is a very scary time. So, I, I am you know. far too uh, advanced in my life journey to wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. 
Uh, I ca cannot wait. I'm really impatient. Uh, so no, a little impatient so, right so November 6th, be really impatient yes. and really persistent. Cast your vote because our future depends on it. Thank you very much for being here.